Mission from Kwajalein to Wachi Island, 175 miles to the northeast. 24 July, Liberators dropped 500 pounders on this bomb pitted island. One of the last Jap strongholds in the Marshalls, Wachi is used largely to practice radar bombing. Three runs were made. The island has been and is being continually hard hit and the airstrip is completely inoperable. This same day, 100 Navy fighters hit gun emplacements with 40 more tons of bombs. Mission from Los Negros to Wolai Island, approximately 750 miles to the northeast. 26 July, 23 Liberators dropped 30 tons of 100 and 250 pounders on gun installations and storage areas. And for five consecutive days, the 24s returned. On this raid, ammo dumps, buildings, and a pontoon bridge connecting Wolai and Palayu Islands were destroyed by direct hits. There was no interception. The runway was unserviceable, and no attempt had been made to fill craters from previous strikes. Mission from Saipan to Tinian, only two and a half miles to the southwest. 31 July, Mitchells left newly won Isley Field to participate with Thunderbolts and TBFs in a raid to end all resistance on nearby Tinian. Invaded a week before, Tinian had been under daily neutralizing attack even while Saipan was being won. Jap remnants had been compressed into Tinian's southern tip, and these bombs were aimed to wipe them out. The raid accomplished its purpose, and the next day, the conquest of Tinian was completed. Mission from Wakti to Palau, over 700 miles to the northwest. 25 August, from their new base at Wakti, 13th Air Force heavies took off on their first operation to make the first daylight raid on Palau. Westernmost of the Carolines, Palau is an important Jap base about 600 miles east of the Philippines. Five Zeeks attacked the first formation. Three 24s were lost. Two collided, and one crashed in flames after being hit by a falling Zeke. Koro Town, administrative center for Japan's mid-Pacific islands, was hit by 84 tons of high explosives. Zeeks continued to attack for 20 minutes, then left the formation to attack another group making a later run. On the 26th and 28th, Liberators returned to drop 100 more tons. 15 September, Marines invaded Palau, and major resistance ended the 19th. Target, airfield on the outskirts of Bucharest, Romania. On August 26th, B-17s of the MAF operating in support of the Romanian government, which on the previous day had declared war on Germany, dropped more than 250 tons on the Otopeni airfield, nine miles north of Bucharest. By September 1st, the Russians had captured the town. Target, railroad bridge 40 miles southeast of Budapest, Hungary. On August 27th, Italy-based bombers hit the Sajol Railroad Bridge over the Tietze River, near the Sajol Marshalling Yards. Each plane carried six 1,000-pounders. The bombing run was made at 21,000 feet. This attack was put in the Balkans and northern Italy to hinder German withdrawals. About 5,000 tons were dropped on the main rail lines of Yugoslavia and Hungary. Within a month of this raid, the Russians had pressed their advance through the Balkans into Hungary, last big German satellite. Target, Meshkols, Hungary. On August 29th, more Italy-based heavies bombed Meshkols, 90 miles northwest of Budapest. Bomb run was made at 22,500 feet. The same day, a Hungarian government crisis crystallized with the fall of the cabinet. A new government expressed allegiance to Germany, along with a firm intention to preserve their Nazi-awarded territory.
46-day siege of Brest completely wrecked the great port. No place in the city or suburbs and very little in the harbor was left undamaged. Because of Nazi fanaticism, no city in France suffered destruction on a vaster scale than this. Here was the railroad station and what was left of the trains. Flying toward the harbor, the big shipping works and great docks were valleys of crumpled masonry, sometimes covering whole ships whose smokestacks poked crazily out of the wreckage. German forts that interlaced all sections had been knocked out. Big guns defended Brest's outer perimeter and spoke its most stubborn defense. That stubbornness continued even after the city's fall, when Nazi leader General Ramke slipped across the harbor to the shelter of big naval guns on the tip of the Crozon Peninsula and held out through two days of terrific bombardment before flying the white flag. The 15 great submarine pens with 20-foot thick concrete roofs and walls still stood almost intact. The framework for a dozen more uncompleted pens stood half collapsed against the solidity of the others. Not a submarine had been left behind. Ships had apparently been scuttled to block the harbor and prevent its easy use by the Allies. One ship was sunk right at the harbor entrance. Viewed from the air day after its surrender, the grotesque ruins of pitted shell holes and ragged walls gave the city the ghostliness of some lunar graveyard. Every house was bomb scarred. Rubble was often more than a story high. The wrecked church of San Luis stood amid German garrisons. Capture of Brest gave the Allies the most spacious anchorage in Europe. It was also the main German submarine base, and many U-boat crews were trapped ashore by a relentless sea blockade. Back of these pens, concreted in the rock, were elaborate officers' quarters, fitted with Persian carpets, fine French wall hangings, silk bed coverlets, and well-stocked wine closets. To seize Brest quickly would have meant diverting a large portion of Allied forces from their drive across France. So it was decided to leave its ultimate capture to a relatively small force and rely on Cherbourg, artificial ports on the Normandy beaches, and air transport to supply Allied armies racing toward Paris. At the expense of Brest, the decision paid off in the capture of France ahead of schedule. First removed from the debris were American dead. But American casualties were relatively small compared to the German. Hundreds of German graves were counted, and thousands of German soldiers and French civilians were wounded. German and American medical corpsmen brought wounded Germans from 18-foot thick concrete hospital bunkers. These air-conditioned wards were built like the Nazi quarters, out of the caves lining Brest's waterfront. Units were well equipped medically, but short of bandages. All were stacked high with cases of excellent food, tinned Danish butter, French mackerel and mushrooms, Turkish dates. Prisoners numbered nearly 40,000. A prisoner bag exceeded only by the 46,000 taken in the Falaise pocket. Some were old, but many were cracked parachute veterans. From the temporary stockade at Landernau, 12 kilometers east of Brest, prisoners were marched to the nearby railroad station, while wounded were transported from the camp by truck and placed aboard hospital trains. Most prisoners realized imminent Nazi defeat and were depressed. But many were arrogant, particularly officers who dressed up for surrender and bedecked with medals and ribbons, strutted about wearing parade uniforms, ceremonial swords and black leather breeches. A surrender request of the Nazis was that the Americans protect them from what the commander termed French terrorists, the fighting French. This was wise anticipation. Prisoners had been convoyed amid a great display of civilian liberation and hate. Citizens growled fury at the Nazis, shook jeering fists, cheered their subjugation. And small, irate bands followed the prisoners to the trains, 
swearing and throwing missiles at them. The Nazis scrambled aboard the freight cars to escape wrath as well as to get places. Brest was a grim example of Nazi resistance. The American campaign was costly in time and supplies. The long battle had laid waste the city, and every trainload of departing Nazis reminded the people of Brest how they had paid for their freedom. <laughs>